And if we are going to talk about a change in perspective, that can happen based on or dependent on that selection, that matter with which I began. It matters what ideas we use to think other ideas. There were certain ideas that we used to think an idea like a knowledge society. Now we use other ideas to talk about something called pandemic societies. So I want to start with that. Reconnaissance talks about strategizing. It may not be far off the mark to really think of the, the perspective that we have as a kind of a strategy. They are very closely linked. What it also does is to enable uh, a bird's eye view, if you want, a survey, a mapping. All these were mentioned earlier, so I'm not repeating it once again. It may have negative connotations because it is a, it is a, it, it's a term that is used largely in the military. But then I don't think we are bothered very much about the military use of this word. But uh, I see in this, this possibility of a change that is possible, the kind of change that we would have in the way in which we look around primarily. So how do we look around in a pandemic society? I think this is a very, very important question that we need to be asking. And what happens when we look around? We tell stories when we look around. There's a very important question. How do we tell stories? How do we tell stories? If you want to elaborate on this question, you can have a whole day session with Professor Jaram here. How do we tell stories? He's an excellent storyteller. What are these stories that we tell? We tell stories. How do we tell them? And what are the stories that we tell? What is this story called pandemic society? This is a question that I think is very, very important. I think what our times tell us is that it, tell, it tells us that storytelling is not or has not gone out of fashion. That it's very important to really sit back, look at ourselves spinning these stories. How is it that we do it? There were many, many stories that came up with the pandemic, stories that uh, we would have heard people telling us, stories that would have been reported in the newspapers. There were museums that were uh, collecting objects. So stories getting curated. For example, you have a book like this. This is a curation. It's an edited book. This is a collection of poems that came out, poems written during the pandemic. It's an act of curation. So there are any number of ways in which we've been trying to tell stories, emphasize the way in which this perhaps is the way uh, we survive with or without the pandemic. There are other stories which are not recorded. I'm sure all of us would have um, a whole lot of stories um, for the byline March 22nd, 2020, which was a Monday. That was the day when the country went into total lockdown. I have a story about that. I think that perhaps is a very interesting opening to the idea of uh, not just the pandemic society, but then the, the kind of factors, the kind of things that came together to create the idea of the pandemic and pandemic society. 
March first week, I drove to Chennai because my mother was hospitalized there. I had to, I drove down with my brother to Chennai before, much before the lockdown, first week of March. My mother had a surgery and uh, I stayed back. My brother drove down to Trivandrum by car, so I didn't have a car. So I was in, I was in Chennai. Uh, uh, the cases were increasing and I had booked my tickets by train to come to Trivandrum. So three days before that, uh, uh, Indian Railways informed me that the train has been cancelled. So I was stuck. So, uh, so I told my brother-in-law, but I have to get to Trivandrum. So that day, newspapers had this remarkable photograph. Pramod is going to talk about photography. There was a photograph of a compartment where people were getting in through the window. And so he said, you are not going to Trivandrum like this. Maybe you should not go. Going by train is ruled out. I said, nothing doing, I have to go. So I said, flight is not an option. It's too expensive. And you never know what you will get if you fly. I said, I'm willing to take the risk. Luckily, I got a special train. Uh, <clears throat> he dropped me at the railway station, Chennai Central Railway Station. I have never seen Chennai Central Railway Station like, railway station like that in my life. And I, I will never see it like that again. It was deserted. I'm sure all of us would have, most of us would have seen this railway station. There was nobody. There were two or three trains on the platform. And I get in, in my compartment, third AC compartment, second AC compartment, there were four passengers from Chennai to Trivandrum. This is my memory, but 25 years from now, I don't know if I will be able to have that memory. And what is it that I will do with this memory? What it did, however, was to give me a perspective of the things that are to come. I never thought, I never imagined that I'll be standing here and then talking about this. You never know, probably it could become one of my favorite stories, I don't know for how long. So even the idea of the favorite can also change. What I've done in that process is that I've tried to collect, but more importantly, I've tried to recollect that story, which is what I think we do in a pandemic society. We, we keep collecting these stories again and again, repeatedly. We are curating it. At the same time, we create those artifacts, those ab objects, those memories that we think will become part of that curation. I would say that also, in a way, forms the foundation, the bedrock of what goes into the making of pandemic societies. I'll read out another uh, remark. Uh, by Andrew Dixon when um, the pandemic started uh, in early 2020. He wrote in the New Yorker something about curation. He was talking to uh, the curator of the Smithsonian and uh, Alexandra Lord. And she makes this very interesting remark. We ourselves as curators are part of a story we are collecting. She said, it's not just that the event is unfolding, she added. It is that many of us are experiencing it too. I didn't want to go to the US. I thought I'll start with Trivandrum and Chennai. So that's why I prefaced it with my example. I'm sure all of us would have any number of those, these stories. The only thing is to curate them. The only thing is to give it a kind of perspective. And if we have, we get a whole lot of negativity around during these times, I would say that is because we are not able to evolve that perspective. Therefore, the question is this. What is the kind of story that is possible? What is the story that is possible now? 
if we have to talk about storytelling or even speculate about possible stories for me um, a thinker a theoretician on translations comes to mind michael cronin uh, he is an irish scholar translate uh, scholar who has written extensively on translation now while talking about translation he uses this idea of portability this is a this is a word that all of us are familiar with i'm not using esoteric terms i'm not dropping names i hope portability we use gadgets we talk about the port we talk about porting there was a problem with porting and that's why we were not able to see the visuals procedure ram had so there can be problems with portability port look at those words that come to mind when you talk about portability port transport port deport and there can be many many more but that crucial word is port stories in translations and otherwise stories are always ported across borders think of any work of translation think of how we were translated by the virus and if not by the virus by the vaccine we were ported in different ways first dose and then after 28 days it was covid shield then 28 became 56 or whatever then it became 3 uh, months or whatever for certain other vaccines there's nothing like that 28 is fixed so there were different ways in which we were being ported to come to terms with this new language as it were that was introduced in a society that is a virus it's a language it's a code and you try to decipher that code this is what was happening so the idea of portability is for me very very interesting here and i borrow it from translation because we have been translated in the past two years in very remarkable ways and we have to learn to live with translations we always learn to live with translations and we are being continuously ported translated stories like i said earlier are always ported across borders people have ported across borders that is a whole history of the world that we have you can think of the silk route right from the silk route or even beyond that or even after that we have had europeans calling on different ports people came to cochin for trade we have cochin harbor you have beipur harbor you have any number of harbors we look at coastal regions people called on ports and look what happened people came they tried to settle down and in the process of settling down they would also have unsettled it always happens if you have to settle down you have to unsettle first that's exactly what the virus did it had to settle down it had to unsettle that which was settled it was an act of porting it was nothing else or it is nothing else it's the act of porting it's a very interesting phenomenon to really theorize like this so we called on different ports and as we called on different ports we started writing history one example would be the history of colonialism and we learned to live with it we have learned to theorize about it and we take it in our stride as teachers as students as intellectuals as pseudo intellectuals everyone but for me the most fascinating thing about uh, the pan- of pandemic societies is that i would like to say that the virus called on port anthropocene let me repeat this 
the virus called on Port Anthropocene. Okay. This is one of the ideas that I would like to present before you. And that is what I was trying to set up earlier. I don't have to uh, explain to you what Anthropocene is. We are, we are told, uh, living in the age of the Anthropocene. So Port Anthropocene, I think, is a fairly reasonable frame of reference that we have. So when people called on ports, there were a whole lot of concerns. Now, when people called on ports, there were a whole lot of concerns. And as I mentioned those concerns, you just think about Port Anthropocene and the virus. So when people called on these ports, there were concerns regarding one, acceptance. How did we accept, refuse, resist the virus? Trust. Trust. Conquest. Colonization. One can, of course, go on. These four. The, the, the parallels, I would say, are uncanny. That's why I would talk about Port Anthropocene. Uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to crack a joke here. I won't do it. I'll do that. I'll whisper later. Um, what it also does when we talk about this porting, it also brings about another very interesting phenomenon when we talk about, especially about pandemic societies. That is the idea of mutations. When you port, when, let us say, you translate from one language, one text to another language, there is a mutation that is very much there. There is a mutation that happens. Now, look, for example, at the human response to the discovery of spaces for inhabitation. I'll give you a very simple example. You just need to think about how 30 years ago this place was like, the place where you have this campus or the hospital right there. 30, 35 years ago, did you have this? I would say that this space has mutated in a different way. It starts talking to you about a very different kind of an experience. Was it five minutes? I think I'll go. I've just started. You can tell promote to wait. <laughs> so I was talking about mutation. The irony, however, is that the virus travels across space and bodies with its mutations. And what it does, when we traveled, we became immigrants, emigrants, migrants, diaspora. You have all these words. And then we also talk about how somebody is a transnational. We might even say that Arundhati Roy is a transnational. Shashi Tharoor is a transnational. But the irony is that when the virus traveled across space and bodies with its different mutations, what it did was it reinvented the idea of transnational movement. It reinvented the idea of transnational movement. How else does one talk about the transfer of technology to the Serum Institute to produce vaccine? It's transnational movement of capital. In other words, the story that we tell is what we must learn to tell. If you don't learn it, you will never tell it. And to tell, as I said earlier, depends a lot on perspective. What did the virus tell? What did the virus tell? And what did we hear when it called on Port Anthropocene? What did we hear? 
One of the first stories that we heard when the virus called on the port Anthropocene was on May 25th, May 25th, 2020. One major global story that we heard when the virus ported uh, here, Port Anthropocene. That was the day when a man choked to death in the United States, George Floyd. If you go back a few more days, we had the lock a lockdown in our country. We suddenly discovered in newspapers in Kerala that we had guests from other states. We had never heard this phrase before. What kind of a story were we telling? And that too, by the state. Imagine how people would have felt, those people from Kerala, who, let's say, would have migrated to maybe 50 years back to Bombay, 60 years back to Bangalore, looking for jobs, and they would get jobs in advertising companies. Imagine how they would have felt if they were referred to as Atiti Thodi Laligal. Right? What is the language that we created with this? What is the identity that we were creating to Hello, human beings. We're talking about human beings. And then we had, let's say, the press conferences every day, every evening. We had a remarkable uh, news reader, if one might put it like that, talking about the concern for stray dogs and monkeys and for birds. It's a remarkable story. It's a remarkable story, all right. But how... Do you think we need to take that story? There were reports of how there were peacocks crossing the road, uh, tigers crossing the road, etc., etc. And we said that nature has a way of coming back. It's a false story. It's a false story. Now, this is not what I'm saying, but I fully endorse this view that I happened to read by Nayanika Mathur. Nainika Mathur had a blog. Uh, it has a very fascinating write-up. What I'll do is I'll read that uh, extract. And there are a couple of things there which really hits you. Two or three sentences. If anything, this should be a moment to reconsider human relationships, a point that was made in the morning. This should be a moment to reconsider human relationships with animals and understand that the pandemic emerges out of an increasingly dysfunctional relationship between human communities, other animals, and the broader environment. The real story of this pandemic, especially when viewed in relationship to animals, is that we humans are the beasts who have caused this particular zoonotic disease, as with several in the past and, in all probability, others lying ahead and in the future. This hit me. And that's when I started going back and looking at the, the whole question of perspective and the way in which we need to reorient ourselves and take look more critically at all those visuals that we that 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 were streamed at one point and they continue to be streamed even today because we have something called the whatsapp university so a whole lot of these things come in so how do you take this the key term was this dysfunctional relationship between human communities other animals and the broader environment we talk about man-animal conflict. Why is it that we talk about man-animal conflict? 
it's a, it's a it's an anthropocentric narrative who is in conflict with whom those narratives are there we have not touched upon them we think that it will be possible one day to call off uh, call the bluff as it were and say that the pandemic has now become an endemic it's as simple as that that's what we think but narratives have a way of being transmitted you cannot put an end to it which means whatever erupted let us say in china or in india was not something that happened one fine summer morning or whatever look at look at how all these narratives come up because this is a narrative it's the way in which we breathe you stop breathing there ends that narrative if you have to start breathing it goes back you have to go through you will have to trace the story back not just to one parent but then it goes back in time right so the point i'm making is that you cannot say that it's all started uh, in early 2020 no i say this because to quote the words of uh, haraway again it's a it's a very interesting uh, observation that she made from 6 years ago she says it matters what matters we use to think other matters with it matters what matters we use to think other matters with philosophical but very true it matters what stories we tell to tell other stories with it matters what stories we tell to tell other stories with it matters what stories make worlds it matters what stories make worlds what worlds make stories you can't put it better you can't put it better as i was <clears throat> looking at many of these narratives i was also struck by uh uh silent springs rachel carson's classic text and i discovered in the process another book which was also equally fascinating that book is titled flight ways life and loss at the edge of extinction this is a book by tom van doren it's titled flight ways life and loss at the edge of extinction it's it is a beautiful way of talking about ex, not just extinction extinction but about the life cycle of um, uh, non humans there's a whole chapter let us say on pigeons this another one on the spider and it talks about the game of strings that we play i'm sure we do that no we have this loop and then we insert our fingers like this and we we create jacob's ladder and all kinds of things the string game that we play uses that to talk about that web that nature of relationship it's a remarkable text there i would like to uh, wind up what i am saying with this idea that um, uh that i think is seminal when we talk about pandemic societies very seminal when we talk about the matters that come together to tell to 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 really recognize about other matters and stories the worlds that we create i was talking about how it matters what stories make worlds and what worlds make stories and that's when i talked about flight ways to my mind comes the dying words of hamlet to horatio absent thee from felicity a while and this ha- in this harsh world draw thy breath in pain to tell me story what do you have there it matters what stories make worlds why else do we read hamlet 
Why else do we teach it even today? What is Fortinbras waiting for in that play? Was he waiting for that last act, that last scene to carry the, the dead bodies? What was he waiting for? What was Hamlet waiting for? What were we waiting for when the play opened? There were two sentries who are waiting for something there. In a, in a remarkable way, that is the Ur text for waiting for Godo. And waiting for Godo is our Ur text. What Hamlet's words also tell us is this. It's a nice, it's a, it's a beautiful way of talking about the act of mourning. It's a remarkable way in which you talk about the act of mourning. We think that mourning is all about sadness and sorrow. But I think this is the grandeur of that play. And I think it is this grandeur that someone like T.S. Eliot completely missed. He was not good at reading plays. Probably he wrote poems, but not this play. I think, I think that is one of those remarkable moments in Hamlet. And so I used Hamlet to bring in a very different perspective to our understanding of mourning. Because when we talk about pandemic, this is what comes to mind. The morning, we all heard about this. We have had people very close to us who passed away. Not just people, pets. Could be pets, it could be people we don't know, people whom we adored, right? It could be many things. It could be even, uh, let us say, other uh, species, uh, uh, let's say, uh, org organ org organisms from other species, as it were. The world changed utterly. A terrible beauty is born. I'm not very sure. <laughs> Possible. But then, what is that? Terrible beauty. Right? Can we separate it? Me and the virus, is there a dichotomy? I don't think so. Because terrible beauty is not a dichotomy. A terrible beauty is born. So to return to this idea of mourning, what, what does it do? Why is it that we remember the dead? Why is it that we remember the dead? How is it that we remember the dead? How do we anthologize the dead? I'll give you an example of that. This is a book. Uh, the process was on, and um, the book is a homage to a remarkable human being. Dr. H.K. Call, who was uh, the leading beacon, as it were, um, of the Poetry Society in Delhi, who uh, was very much involved with the India Habitat Center, etc. He passed away in the early period of the COVID. And this book is dedicated to his memory. So, morning. Also, there's a way in which you even try to, if one might use the word curate, morning. You try to curate memory. H.K. Kaul, founder, director, Delnet, developing library network and founder, secretary general and president, the Poetry Society India. He was chief librarian, um, like I said, of the IIC library. It opens, this book opens with a poem that he wrote. I'll read that poem. In this form-filling, sound-filling world, there are so many eyes to look at or look through in ham-handed ways. They block, they open the roads to the unseen power, the transcendental reality. From this mystical feminine energy zone, toiling through heat and dust, personifying the energy, 
the other end remains elusive. In threadbare outfits, dullest embroidery, tension for bending rules does not help. Re-engineering my form, tailoring outfits, I need to dive into the third eye to bridge the fathomless to this withering form and go beyond personification of the forms. It starts with that. And then when he passed away, Rita Malhotra wrote this poem, Blurred Lines, for Dr. Cowell, 1st July 2020. Today, I can only pen silence as our poet mate steps into the oblivion of ethereal eternity. Time stands alone, time stands stone still. Myriad thoughts unfurl and float in through flakes of reminiscences to fill sad, empty spaces of reality between sun and anti-sun, between moon and anti-moon with everlasting remembrance lines. Nature's metaphysical canvas capture the guardian angel's broken wing, the devastated hibiscus blooms collapse like soap bubbles. Notes of Beethoven's moving symphony, the funeral cantata, drift in with the sensed yet hardly felt strike breeze. In the chorus of a thousand prayers, a million memories in poetic drape rise to moist, tranquil eyes, then diffuse into the purple brilliance of a peaceful new awakening, a timeless awakening for the imperishable soul. This is Rita Malhotra, remembering him. And you have, of course, so many others uh, writing. And you have poems written here in, in English and also in Hindi. So I don't want to read the entire book. But what it does is it helps to put in perspective the idea of mourning that I was trying to talk about and what uh, Tom Van Doreen had to say about mourning. This is what he says. Mourning offers us a way into an alternative space, one of acknowledgement of and respect for the dead. In this context, mourning undoes any pretense toward exceptionalism. Mourning undoes any pretense toward exceptionalism. Instead, drawing us into an awareness of the multi-species continuities and connectivities that make life possible for everyone. Instead, drawing us into an awareness of the multi-species continuities and connectivities that make life possible for everyone. This is what he says. Then, therefore, we have to begin. So I'm coming almost to the end of my lecture. So at this point, I'm beginning. We always begin in the middle of things. It could be either be in media's res or the less heard in media's rebus. So see at what point we start mourning. Is it at the end? Beginning? Somewhere in between, we have to begin perhaps with the possibility of mourning. This is the change in perspective that I was talking about. Or the portability of mourning. That is a story awaiting pandemic societies. We need, therefore, to learn to tell the story of our entanglement in the world. And we will be able to talk about that entanglement only when we become aware of the multi-species continuities and connectivities that make life possible for everyone. It's an entanglement. 
And if we are able to bring in or recognize that entanglement in the world, then I think at the end of my lecture, we can think of a tentative beginning. Thank you very much. So I, uh, I should profoundly thank you, Harry, for your elegiac obituary to all those who perished in this pandemic. I take it as a brilliant and touching obituary. It was the most fitting obituary that we could uh, raise on this occasion. It's proper that we remember all those who perished when we take up that the whole matter. Again, that's the importance of the word reconnaissance. It's not a survey of the past. It is still you know, a time to remember, a time to port, as you say. And another brilliant idea that I would uh, you know, like to connect with what you said, literally, you know, right from ancient times, the days of Black Death onwards, pandemic literally was ported through ships. We are told that pandemics came to Europe through Asia, uh, through ships, actually. And, you know, transportation of slaves and trade routes, he mentioned trade routes. And the ships carried, actually, people who were carriers of these, uh, these germs, actually. They were responsible. And even today, uh, the Europeans think that uh, pandemics came from Asia. It was literally a kind of porting. And most of the ports were shut down to these, uh, when, they, when they realized this kind of spreading, uh, wide spreading, they started shutting down the ports. A kind of, kind of deportation was uh, actually put in practice. And the word quarantine is as ancient as the history of, uh, you know, uh, pandemics. And uh, I was amazed at the, at the actual literal truth in porting, you know. And the way you, you, you transported us into a kind of a different port. Thank you so much. It was a wonderful talk. Let, let me add to what you said. There is another example. Uh, since you mentioned ships, I should have mentioned it. Uh, how ships brought in slaves, but then these, uh, the germs, they were all carriers. Apart from that, the ships carried another very interesting species, rats. Rats and fleas also. And fleas. Uh. And all of us have heard about the dodo. The dodo. The dodo is extinct. You know how it became extinct? Because of the rats. Because of the rats that were carriers that came in. And that's what you have in that flight, that book. That book talks about the dodo. There's a whole chapter that begins with the story of the dodo. So, uh, that idea of the dysfunctional, I think, is so very crucial. And I think it's all the more necessary for us to mourn. The floor is open for a question and answer session. It, it can even be a thought session, if not a question and answer session. Or a mind session, where you speak your thought or speak your mind. It needn't be a question. As Sir told, it can be a thought session and uh, we can express our emotions also. Like what you said, it's curating stories and uh, making stories, developing stories, imagining stories, all the more experiencing stories and recollecting it. And for everyone, for me too, this uh, pandemic gave me a one. It's not a wonderful story, I can say, but a story that I can always relate with me. As you said, I lost my mother this during this pandemic and I was in a place where I couldn't travel, deporting, portability, all these things, I was able to literally identify with what Sir was telling. And what I understood was that there was always a chance, always there was a plan for everyone to allocate the responsibility to the other. The pandemic always taught many people to allocate the responsibility to the other. That is, he or she or the other is responsible. I think the pandemic taught us also that it is not the other responsible. As Radha Krishna sir was telling, it is we, the responsible people. As we are in the media world, there is a series going on, We Was, in Netflix. I hope 
as some of you might have seen the first session of the speech that the doctor speaks he speaks about the same thing that is how the environmental changes has started depleting the ice in the arctic has created the viruses which had been completely stagnant so it is a time for us to rethink that who is responsible and thank you very much sir it was literally an enlightening thank you sir uh, thank you sir for that enlightening session and your erudite words